The western end of the Gib River Road seems to define the age of the earth tangibly. Ancient limestone reefs compete with gorges cut deep into sandstone beds, themselves laid down over millions of years under the rolling blue of an ocean that once covered much more of the Earth's surface. In this episode, we travel through time, taking in the primeval geology that formed Bell Gorge, visiting the site of the bloodiest war on Australian soil, and checking out a recent land experiment designed to make amends for past abuses. Thanks to easy access and its singular scale and beauty, Bell Gorge is one of the most popular spots in the Kimberley. Located in the King Leopold Ranges, about 250 kilometers east of Derby, it is one of the few Kimberley icons protected by a national park. After a few days of traveling up the Gibb River Road doing the Gibb River Road shutter, you're gonna come across Bell Gorge. Now, Bell Gorge, I will guarantee you, is gonna take your breath away. You will have seen lots of mountain ranges and you will have seen lots of gorges by the time you get here. But this one is just amazing. It is the granddaddy of them all. Once you get into the gorge itself, you're gonna have to make a couple of pretty big decisions. Things on some really important stuff like, which water hole am I gonna swim in today? Or even worse, which rock will I sun myself on? There's so many spots here that you just have to find the one that you fall in love with and spend a bit of time there. As you start getting further down into the gorge, it really starts to consume you. The size of this place is breathtaking. You've only got to stand in the one spot for five minutes and you'll see the colours of the rocks change what seems like thousands of times. But along with that comes a bit of a problem. The depth of the side of these gorges actually makes it that the sun doesn't really touch the water all day, which means that water is ice cold. One of the hardest things about outback travel is keeping your tires healthy. There's a lot of things out here that can uh, destroy or maim a tire. But uh, this is a first for me. I must have hit an echidna yesterday and there's about 50 spines in this uh, BF here. Now it's held up pretty well but one of them that I stupidly decided to pull out of the tire to have a look at uh, left a little thin hiss behind it. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and plug this. Now this one's just here. So it's, it's in the main wall of the tire and I'm gonna give it a go. So the first thing we're gonna do is ream out the hole. It's a little hole and there's no way I'll get a plug in there as it is. So it sounds counterintuitive, but uh, you need to actually get the hole to sort of a standard size. So these things come with a bit of grease just to help work this into the hole. And basically what you're doing here is making a bigger hole than what you started with so that it'll actually take a plug. So the next step is literally just to plug the hole. So you work one of these plugs into the tool, jam it in the hole. This hole's small enough that 
one plug should do it. And that looks like it's done the job. So all I've got to do now, just trim the send off so it's not rubbing on the road and we should be good to go. And the moral of the story here is, you spend a few extra bucks at ARB before you leave, you can save hundreds down the road in tires. There's no better way to finish a great day than to turn up at a great campsite. And that's what they've achieved here. We spent the day down at the gorge, looking around, swimming, exploring, and just enjoying ourselves. And to come back and then have to set up a site in a camping area that you don't feel good in, just doesn't top the day off. This is a place where you feel good. The infrastructure here is really well put together. They've got volunteers at the gate that'll ask you what size group you're in, put you in a site that suits you, fire rings, other facilities. It's just a, a nice place to come and camp. Coming up, I get back in the saddle at Birdwood Downs. With fires burning in every direction, turning the sky a muddy red color, we headed west down the Gibb River Road toward a station that has, for the last three decades, been challenging the old view on land management in Australia. In 1978, Birdwood Down Station was established as a real-life way to test the idea that land could be regenerated, not simply abused, as generations of pastoralists have done across the Australian outback. The idea that the land is endless and self-sufficient is one that is wearing off quickly, and this 1900 hectare property might just represent real hope for bringing back the fragile ecosystem of the Kimberley, one station at a time. I'm told that the only real way to understand this land is on horseback. So Hans and I saddled up and headed out to take a look at this unique station, to get a feel for it up close and personal. I haven't been on a horse in a few years, but if they're anything like bicycles, I figured I would be fine. And these were little horses too, the same breed that has been working this country for a hundred years. Birdwood Downs is a 5,000 acre station located at the western end of the Gibb River Road. It's a station quite unlike any other out here. It's part of a 40 year experiment to see if this land could be regenerated. From around 1880, Kimberley was grazed and overgrazed quite heavily by cattle. And uh, there's not much left in the land. So this is part of an experiment to see if they can fix that, make a little bit more out of the land and make it viable again for cattle. I'm here with Hans, one of the directors here who runs the place. And Hans, you've got uh, quite the life, mate. This is a beautiful life here, absolutely, yeah. Pretty passionate about what you do, mate. You, uh, you must believe in this place. I certainly believe in this place. It is a beautiful experiment. Many people say it's an impossible job, but that makes it the challenge that it is. A lot of places have the word eco in the name, but sometimes that means they use bamboo towels or something in the toilets. You guys are actually trying to fix this ecosystem. Yes, th that is what we have been doing and that is what we keep doing. And eco is more than just fixing the grass. Uh, it is uh, being very careful with the resources that we use. Uh, we run on solar power and we are just very careful in what we use. I noticed you, you drive horses instead of land cruisers out yeah, here. That's so much more fun. <laughs> that is so much more fun. You don't distinguish between job and fun. Not when you're working here. This is really good fun. This is uh, Paho here. Paho is uh, one horsepower. We're gonna go exploring and see if we can find some old trees. I've been traveling the outback by four wheel drive for over a decade now working. And the one thing that consistently falls over is the 12 volt systems if you don't have the right gear. Now in the 100 series here, I've got five onboard batteries. There's two in the back to run all the camera gear, laptops and everything else. 
And up the front here, I've got two auxiliary batteries just to run the fridges, lights, and everything in the dash. It's a lot of batteries to keep charged up, so I really need to depend on the battery chargers. Now up in the front here, I've got a BC-DC. It's a 40 amp DC to DC charger. And the benefit of that, you keep them right next to the battery. You're getting 40 amps of the highest voltage juice that you can get into those batteries. It's the only way to go on the road. It keeps these marine batteries topped up all the time. I've actually got a 270 amp alternator under here as well, just to get extra juice into everything. But the Red Oak gear is beautiful. Waterproof, dustproof, pretty much Carlisle proof on the road. I can depend on these. Now I actually got a Red Arc battery isolator behind here, which runs straight back to the Anderson plug. So it sounds pretty complicated, but it's the best way to manage all those batteries, keep everything charged up, so I can depend upon this stuff to run everything I need to in the bush whenever I need it. I'm down the yards here today with Greg from Birdwood Down Station. Greg, what's different to being the station manager here to being on your average run-of-the-mill station in the Kimberley? It's mainly the scale that makes it a lot different. Berber Downs is not a big place, so we have to be diversified in, in, in what we do. So um, we breed the horses, we sell some horses, and we use the horses for uh, riding lessons and trail rides. So um, being diversified is the only way we can um, live the lifestyle that we want to live here. So at Birdwood Downs, mate, you seem to be very focused on on the environment and making sure that it's um, managed for, for future use, you know, not overgrazing and things like that. Is that a, a different mindset you need when you're managing this sort of place? This place is um, 30 years old and when it was born, the place was so degraded and the whole idea of this place was to bring it back to what it naturally was before the cattle. So it, it, it is the biggest thing that we focus on. something about being in this part of the country on horseback. You jump on the back of one of these guys and walk around. You got time to look at the land, time to watch the sunset and really soak in the Kimberley. Now Hans, there's, uh, there's a tree behind us here that looks like uh, not many I've seen before. There's a few old Boabs in the Kimberley. And this one is really old. They say that Boabs can live up to 2,000 years old and apparently this one's been carbon dated. Yes, uh, and it's carbon dated 1,500 years, which is amazing. Means it was a little baby bow up at the beginning of the Middle Ages. The age of the Kimberley is such a tangible part of it, and I think you feel that when you're out here. But I just, I just love being out here on the horses, mate. It is so beautiful. This is why I'm here. It is beautiful every day. As the sun fell through a gauze of smoke, we soaked in the red light feeling all too young against this prehistoric backdrop, against a land so unremittingly romantic, a land that can remove you from yourself completely. Coming up next, we visit John Damara country in the Napier Ranges. The limestone reefs that make up the Napier and Oscar ranges in the western Kimberley were once coral reefs jutting up from the floor of an ocean that covered most of the earth. Now the same water that once sheltered them falls as rain and carves the grey stone into jagged spires against the endless Spinifex plain. The country defined by these ranges is the site of the bloodiest war on Australian soil that of the Banuba resistance to colonialization, or John Damara's war. In 1879, Alexander Forrest opened up the Kimberley to pastoralism with his expedition to the Fitzroy and Ord rivers. Five years later, an Aboriginal named John Damara, in this very spot, began a revolt against the white invasion that led to a three-year war, and it was probably the bloodiest war ever fought on Australian soil. 
John DeMara was working with the police after proving himself useful with a horse and gun. But when he and Constable Richardson rounded up many of John DeMara's family members, he went rogue, killing his friend and freeing his family. They took refuge in the caves of the Napier Range. Behind me is the entrance to Tunnel Creek. This is a pretty special place for the Baduba people. This is where John DeMara hid out with his mother and several wives. Apparently, uh, they had a bit of special magic back then to heal him from his bullet wounds that he was getting from the white fellas. And this was one of many caves that they hid out in. These caves ran all through the Napier Range and allowed John Amara and his uncles and the rest of the Banuba resistance to evade the police and also have somewhere to hide out where no one could find them. Tunnel Creek is one of many cave systems that run through these limestone cliffs, and it afforded John Damara's resistance a safe haven and easy retreat from any direction. His knowledge of the land and guerrilla tactics kept his war going for years. Four-wheel driving has changed a lot over the years. It used to be you went somewhere, got lost, and spent half the afternoon finding your way back out again. Today, you can still get lost if you want to, but there's no good excuse for staying that way. The guys at HEMA have come up with lots of great options to find your way in and back out again. I love the application for the iPhone and the iPad. Both of these screens are brilliant to work with. It's dead easy software to use, and you get all of HEMA's maps in one place without having to carry around a binder full of paper maps. The HN6 and the HN5 are also awesome options. They provide all-in-one navigation, so you get your on- and off-road navigation in one unit. Now, you don't need all of this stuff. I'm just a bit lazy. Don't like to uh, change the screens all the time, and I can actually have about six maps open at once, which gives me a lot of information while I'm going on the road. Any one of these will do the job, and I'm telling you, it makes life a lot easier. When John and Gorge was actually the scene of the first and the bloodiest battle of the Benumba Rebellion. This is where John Damara took Elamara and the rest of his elders once they escaped from the police station. It wasn't long until some white fellas came along and John Damara and his merry band uh, gave him a hard time, killed a few of them, retreated back up into the caves. Shortly thereafter, the police brought in a lot more white settlers to settle the score. It was a huge gun battle here. You can just imagine those shots ringing out against these cliffs. El Amaro was killed, along with half of John Amaro's mates. So he retreated back up into the caves to lick his wounds and began what was to become a three-year guerrilla war campaign against the white settlers. As you walk into Winjana Gorge, every step seems to draw you in, to remind you that this isn't just any place. It is a holy site for many reasons, for its beauty alone, for its role in Australia's only real Aboriginal rebellion, and for its timelessness, its ability to absorb our history into its ochre walls, bastions that seem eternal against the sky. Every afternoon, the sun comes into Winjana Gorge and lights up these cliffs. It's easy to come here and appreciate the solitude, just the, the color of this place as it goes down, but there's a darker history here. These very same cliffs are with John Amara, El Amara, and the rest of their gang essentially defended their country against the invasion of the whites into the Kimberley. It was the first violent uh, backlash from the Aborigines ever in the history of Australian settlements. And it's easy to just sit here, look around, listen to the solitude, and you can, you can almost imagine that moment when they heard the settlers coming in, and they knew that they were probably gonna lose. But it was one of those battles that you fight anyway. You fight knowing you're gonna lose because you have to. Johnny Gorge isn't just uh, history, there's a bit of natural history here too. It's one of the best places in the Kimberley to see the freshwater crocodile, relatively up close and personal. This guy's a little nervous. It's good to know that they're more afraid of us than we are of them. You can swim here, but most people don't. Um, 
because of these little monster looking things, but they're uh, relatively harmless. Unless it, they're getting up to no good and you bother them, they'll probably leave you alone. And I kind of think uh, I'm going to leave him alone this time as well. The western fringe of the Kimberley wilderness is a land soaked in colour, in layers of history and blood. I feel a part of something greater here. My heart fills up and I'm at peace. Here's to another day, living the dream.